right. Hello, guys. Hope you're having a fantastic day. Um, and thank you for joining me for our Church 360 Ledger um, kind of 1.0 or uh, 101 sort of thing. Uh, just uh, showing you how to do the initial setup of your chart of accounts, kind of the uh, the accounting principles that it uses, just kind of starting from the ground up. So. My name is Taylor Brown. I am a support technician here at Concordia. I'm very happy to be part of this ministry. I think it's I think it's wonderful. I used to work on Sundays and I was always so uh, bummed out that I didn't get to spend time with my church and now I get to spend time with churches all week. So I'm excited. So uh, all phones and microphones have been muted. Um, so if you do have a question, please feel free to just type it into that little question area um, for the webinar and either I will answer it, you know, during uh, my spiel or um, I'm not going to be paying too much attention to it. So I do have my friend Rod Kyles also kind of in that little question area and he'll answer questions as they come in and anything that uh, he doesn't get, you know, we're going to have plenty of time after the webinar for me to answer any of your questions. And uh, worse comes to worse, or if it's more of a specific question, particular just to your side or your church, then we can always arrange a call um, just one on one as well. So just kind of as a general overview, you know, we're just going to go over this class agenda and then we're going to uh, start from the very beginning of your ledger site. So. That includes um, being the first person to log in, kind of the navigation of the site, importing your uh, Shepherd Staff database if you're moving from Shepherd Staff to Church 360, and then just kind of the general setup of things, including like administrative settings, like your church information, check information, um, things like that setting up your books or your set of accounts, your payees or your vendors, those are important for writing checks. And then we're going to go into kind of the basic account principles that the software uses, very similar to a lot of other accounting software, it uses dual entry bookkeeping and just kind of the usual asset liability income expense, and then we'll have restricted funds that will going over as well. And when we go over that, it'll be when we create our chart of accounts, including going over all of those account types and paying special attention to uh, the restricted funds uh, in the software, which might act a little bit differently, especially if you came from Shepherd staff, it works uh, very differently from your dedicated accounts. So we'll be going over that as well. Then I'll lightly be going over budgets for your income and expense accounts. And then also uh, how to change your fiscal years for uh, you know, closing out your fiscal year, as well as accessing different uh, previous fiscal years for you know, previous reporting if you need to. Then we'll just have just a brief little quiz, you know, it, I'm not going to tell your pastor, you know, it's not graded, uh, but just to make sure that we hammer in those. Uh, particular aspects of the software. And then the rest of the time, it's just completely dedicated to a Q&A session. So I'm more than happy to stay here as long as you guys need. And uh, looking at my material, it is kind of, uh, it is kind of packed full of content. So I'm probably going to end up taking probably the full hour. It might be a little shorter, might be a little longer, but I am going to try and stay in that hour long window. So let's just go ahead and get started. So, so first off, you're going to contact your sales consultant and they're going to, you know, have you sign a license agreement, make that purchase, and then uh, they're going to actually create your account. And with that account, they're going to create a primary contact, and that's going to be most likely whoever it is that signed the license agreement. 
And so you're, end up, you're gonna end up getting an email, something like this. And before I forget, let me turn off my webcam just so that the screen's just a little bit bigger for you. Okay then. So you'll be getting a email pretty similar to this. Uh, you'll, be, you'll be welcome to your church uh, 360 ledger account. It'll have your church's name. And then you'll have this big old button for setting up your account now. If for whatever reason uh, this doesn't work, feel free to just click on this link. It takes you to the exact same place. So we'll go ahead and click on that and it will open up your Church360 Ledger site with your email already entered into it, as well as asking for your password. So I have things uh, just auto-filled right here, but you would put your email and then your two passwords and then you would just sign up and then that will create your actual login for this site. Of course, it always has a problem with me, but once you go ahead and sign up, I hate it when it does this. I swear, whenever I do my practice ones, this never happens. Mm -hmm but eventually it is going to show up uh, here. Let's see. Sorry guys, I do apologize. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There we go. Okay, thank you for your patience with that. So once you actually, uh, you know, click to create your, uh, your, your login, once you click sign in, you'll be taken to this church details page and you'll just want to make sure that, you know, everything is uh, put in as you need, you know, for things like uh, your checks or your statements or stuff like that. Um, you can always change this. Uh, later in your account settings, but uh, you know, just to get off on the right foot, you can go ahead and put in your church details here. And once you submit it, then you'll have two options. So uh, it's important that you make your decision uh, right here because you're until we actually until you like contact support and we go in and reset your entire site, you're, prop, you're never going to be seeing this, uh, this part again. Let's see. And so if you're moving from your Shepherd staff, if you had uh, like the Shepherd staff finance module, you do have the option to import your database. And uh, you could always use uh, this kind of right hand option you would basically just choose the file and then you'd uh, go into your file explorer and choose your database. And then you would choose whether you wanted to import everything or just the chart of accounts. Um, the reason I wanna bring this up is because if in your finance module, if at any time you had any dedicated funds, because the move from dedicated funds to restricted funds is so, uh, so different. If you do have dedicated funds, only your chart of accounts and balances will be brought over. So uh, it's important to keep that in mind that if you do have any dedicated accounts, your, your transactions will not be imported. Uh, but otherwise, uh, you can definitely choose whether or not to import those transactions. And then once you add that database, then you'll be able to choose what asset accounts you want to connect those dedicated accounts to. Uh, but if you're starting just from scratch, then you can take the former option and just start your own book. Uh, you can always just choose your first book name. It could just be Price Community. 
if I can spell. Just whatever your first book is, it is going to be your collection of accounts and transactions. So it's going to be uh, just kind of self-contained. So you're going to want to make sure that uh, if you do create multiple books, that they are going to be separate accounts, separate everything. So uh, most churches are only going to have that one book for their main account. And if they have something like um, uh, a, a cemetery or a, a school or some other daycare program where they have their completely different set of books, then you might want to create a new one. Uh, but otherwise, everything is going to be contained into this single book. Once you put in your book name, you can choose uh, the beginning of your fiscal year, whether it's in January or maybe in the middle of the, the calendar year, if it's a non-calendar year. And then you can choose the start date for the book. So this is what uh, the date that you're going to set your initial balances. So anything prior to this date, you won't be able to create any transactions. So you'll want to uh, uh, just make sure that you choose uh, uh, a start date that fits your needs. And you can change this later if need be. Once you put in that information, you can click Submit and you'll be welcomed into your new, uh, your new site. And here you can see it's kind of kind of empty naturally. But uh, but once you start putting more and more uh, information in it, uh, then you'll be able to uh, be able to see it kind of come together. Before I go any further, I also wanted to make note of our URL. So you can notice up here where it says ChristComChurch.360Ledger.com. The Christ Com Church, that is what we call your subdomain. So it's important to make sure that you know that subdomain so that if you ever wanted to go into a different site or a different uh, device and you wanted to go online and access your Church 360 account, it's always going to have that same subdomain. So uh, if I ever wanted to go home and access my ledger site, I would just remember ChristComChurch.360Ledger.com, and then I'd be able to log in and work on it. If you have different uh, 360 facets, like Church 360 Members or Church 360 Unite, they're going to share this same subdomain. So it, for your member site, it would be ChristComChurch.360Members.com, or .360unite.com. And so then they will all be able to sync and kind of talk to one another um, in various ways, not really unite and ledger, but uh, they will all kind of share that subdomain. And so uh, that's just an extra security feature so that you know only those kind of uh, sites talk to each other. So once you've already logged in, you know, you may decide that you want to uh, either create a bookmark for your browser, or you could add a desktop icon for your Church 360 ledger. And either one are possible. Once you're already logged in, you'll be able to say this is Chrome. You could go up here to where these three dots are. And under here where it says uh, history downloads, and then there's bookmarks. And here you'll be able to bookmark this tab. So then, uh, you know, if you have a bookmark uh, menu, then whenever you're, you want to uh, access your ledger site, then it'll just be that much easier. And on the other hand, if you wanted, say, to have an icon uh, strictly for Church 360 Ledger, you could uh, kind of just click on or kind of click and hold this icon right here where uh, this little dollar sign here, and you should be able to move that on over. If it doesn't, you can also click on the URL and move it on over. It'll say that it can't, but you'll be able to add in 
uh, your own uh, shortcut on your desktop, if that's just a little bit easier. So next we can just go over our navigation and I just want to reopen another site right here where you can kind of see uh, when it's kind of filled up where it has more accounts, more activities, you'll be able to uh, just kind of see really what, uh, what Church 360 Ledger is all about. So here, on the very top hand or the top corner, you can see your home button, which is this uh, little dollar sign right here. Whenever you want to just go straight back here to the home page, no matter where you are, you can always just click on here and it'll take you right here for your uh, different summaries. Right next to it, where it says Christ Community Church, this is your current book. And you can see this little carrot right here, and it shows that it's a drop down menu. If you click on it right here, you can see the various books that you might have created. So, again, uh, your books are going to be just separate collections of accounts. So, these are going to be completely separate um, accounting wise. So, anytime you move uh, anything from, say, Christ Community Church to, say, school books, then it's going to either be written as a loan if you intend to pay it back, or it's going to be a gift, uh, most likely in the form of a check or other payment, uh, and then deposited into that other uh, book as if they are just completely separate entities. But we'll go over that in transactions uh, tomorrow as well. Moving over a little to the right, we have a print queue, and here you can see this little 22 right here. It can show it shows you that there are uh, 22 checks in your check print queue. Uh, so you know you can always go down here once you write a check, which we'll go over uh, more tomorrow. Then it will end up showing here in your print queue, and directly from this queue, you'll be able to print it or just kind of mark it as printed if maybe it's like a handwritten chat. One more over, we have our pending transactions. So if you uh, have any sort of recurring transactions or anything that's planned, or if you also share a subdomain with a Church360 member site, our Church 360 members is our church management software where you can put in things like your members and attendance information as well as offerings. So in addition to being able to, to print off reports like contribution statements in members, not only will you be able to attribute those offerings to those people, but when you enter in those offerings, those batches will actually come over to Church 360 Ledger as deposits. So instead of having to just manually put in those offerings, you'll be able to uh, add those in by using these pending transactions, which again, we'll be going over just a little bit more uh, tomorrow. In this spiral bound notebook sort of symbol, we have our four main reports, our general ledger, income and expense, chart of accounts, just the report in this aspect, and the balance sheet as well as the event log. Uh, so those are the four or five main reports in Church 360 Ledger, but many of them, many of our views can be exported and uh, kind of pivoted using Excel. We'll be going over more of that on Thursday. Um, for our reports webinar. Then we have this little gear icon, and you'll also see that in this little section, they are divided into two separate halves, so to speak. So this first half, the chart of accounts, budgets, fiscal years, and recurring and imported transactions, this is uh, regarding this particular book. So all of these right here, all five of these is in regards to just the Christ Community Church book. 
So if we wanted to access different budgets or different chart of accounts for a different book, you would go over here and change your book before being able to access that information. Then on the bottom, we have more of the general things. Uh, the general users, roles, books, and payees, those are all in regards to the site itself. So uh, it's more it's more general, more overarching, and uh, you'll have much more uh, control over exactly how the site works uh, with your different books. So I'll be coming back to that in just a second. But all the way over to the right is our uh, user settings. So if you ever needed to change anything for your particular login that you're logged in with right now, uh, then you can always go up to your icon and go into user settings if you need to, including uh, being able to uh, change your password um, as opposed to uh, logging in using the forgot your password link uh, located on the login screen. Then right underneath, we have this little white bar, and this is what we call the Omni bar. And it's just kind of the Omni bar for it, it being able to kind of travel wherever it is that you need. If you click inside of it, then you'll have access to all of the accounts for this book. And then you can just go down here, uh, find that direct account and go straight there if you need to. And this will be visible on no matter what view it is that you're on. So anywhere that you need to be, you can navigate it uh, directly from whatever page that you're on. Then right next to it, we have a little button that says new transaction. And this is where you create your transactions. Uh, if you click on here, you'll be able to create your transfer, deposit, payment, check, or journal entry just directly from the screen. And again, this will be uh, located uh, right above all of your screens, so you'll be able to create a transaction no matter what view you're looking at currently. We'll be going over how to create those transactions uh, tomorrow. Then. I go back to the home page. Then you can see below the Omni bar and the new transaction button, we have kind of, we have these little breadcrumbs just to kind of show where you are. So this shows that, you know, you're on the home screen and you can use this drop down menu to kind of hide the uh, specifics of the home view. Uh, and then you can just navigate to specific accounts if you need to. So instead of having to go up here to the Omni bar and scroll down and find your asset, you could just click the assets here and you could just see uh, your particular assets for this book. So it just kind of drills down just more and more as you, uh, as you click on these and you just keep going further and further. And if you ever need to, you know, back out and go back, then you can definitely use these breadcrumbs to do so. Also, for most views, I can't think of any views off the top of my head except maybe the print queue, um, but most of our views, you're able to export to Excel if you know you just work with Excel better, or you can also print. So you could print directly from your uh, your browser if you so want to. So really, uh, whichever reporting structure or any sort of software, any spreadsheet software that you are just more comfortable with, then we just want you to have that aspect, uh, just whatever makes you more comfortable. And then finally over here, we have the date selector. So in this little drop down menu, uh, you can see there's 2022, but if you click on this little drop down menu, you can see that you can choose various uh, different date ranges if you need to. So not only can you select by year if you want to, 
you wanted previous information, but you can also drill down to your different quarter or even a month. Or if you uh, have more specific needs, you can go down here to this uh, date range selector and you can either type in your date range or you can use this little calendar app for whatever range it is that you need for your reports or for your views. And whichever one that you choose, even if you go to, say, a different report, it will maintain that different date range until you manually change it to something else. So just to make things just a little bit easier, if you are going back for looking for previous reports, uh, then hopefully uh, that kind of stickiness to your date range is just a little uh, easier for you. So I'm going to circle back to this gear icon. And I'm going to skip down here to just the general settings for right now, just for the site settings for right now. And here, when you initially created your site, you did see that you were able to choose your different addresses, your church phone number, as well as your church name. Uh, and you can definitely change that here if any of those change. You'll also notice that there is a customer number here. And if you ever like call into support or call into customer service and you need a uh, need an answer about your your software this customer number is definitely going to uh, speed up the process otherwise you could always just give your church name and zip code to support and we can figure it out but it's just always nice to have that option should you ever need that next we have our check style and we have two different styles we have the top and we have the middle i have not run into any a uh, person who used the bottom, but if you guys do use that, let me know. I'm, we want, might put it in feedback. I'm not really sure. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the top and the middle, those are definitely the most popular check styles. And in fact, if you have uh, like the middle checks from like using Shepherd Staff, the finance module, then those checks will be able to work in Ledger as well. Currently, we don't offer three checks per sheet, um, but uh, we definitely are always open for feedback, just depending on whatever the demands are. And once you choose this check style, once you go into the print queue, you'll be able to print from the browser just directly onto whatever check stock you have. Now, I have a feeling most likely you guys won't be working on this site just by yourselves, just with one administrator. So you can definitely invite people uh, to see specific parts of this software. And to do that, you would go up here to the gear icon and you would invite users. And when you invite users, you'll be able to determine their permissions by assigning them a specific role. So let's just skip users for right now. Let's just go to roles because you'll wanna create these before you invite people. So if we go over here to roles, you'll have a list of different, uh, different permissions, just kind of defaults. It'll not be as, as many as you see here, but you can always create more if you so need to. Um, let's see. And when you do decide to uh, add in some of these, you can click on the role or when you're adding in a new role, and you'll be able to see that uh, after you name it, the next one right here, you'll be able to actually choose what book they have access to. So if you want them to have access to only Christ Community Church and none of the other ones that you have up here, then you can certainly do that. And if you wanted to add more, then you can definitely add those to them as well. And even after you invite 
users over uh, to your site. Should you ever need to just change this role, you can certainly come in here and edit those roles for everybody who has this assigned role and it will affect all of their permissions immediately. Then further down, we have management. So exactly, we want to know how much power they are going to have. If we want them to be able to manage the chart of accounts or manage reoccurring transactions like payroll, or if you want them to just be able to view either all of the accounts or if you want specific accounts, then you can certainly choose exactly which accounts you want to be uh, shown. And after you choose specific accounts from one book, if they have multiple books that they're allowed to see, then you can also uh, use the drop down menu and you can check uh, exactly what accounts you want them to be able to see as well. Then finally, we have what do you want them to be able to do as far as transactions? So if you want them to be able to edit any transactions, then you'll, be, you'll want to uh, check this. If you want just any transactions, then you can just uh, check these and this will include all of them naturally. Um, but if you want them to only be able to create, say, deposits or payments, then you can certainly uh, use that kind of granular permissions, those granular permissions to determine exactly what it is that they can do. And in addition to that, even if they can create checks, then you can also give them the opportunity to print checks as well, if you want them to have that permission. And once everything is looking good, you click Submit, and those uh, roles will be updated. So once you have those roles set up, then you can go back up here to the gear icon, and now we can actually start inviting users. So naturally, you're most likely not going to have five different administrators, but we do definitely recommend having at least two. Just in case uh, someone leaves, uh, then you don't want uh, just all of your access to your ledger site to be just, dedicated, just uh, restricted to just that one person. Of course, if that ever happens, you're more than welcome to contact support. We will have to have you sign a form, just kind of get permission from your pastor uh, to move that over. Uh, but we do generally recommend just having multiple administrators just so that you never really lose access to your accounts. And just like roles, you can always come in here and you can edit those users. So if maybe one administrator one person you know is just no longer a treasurer anymore so maybe they're just you know a financial secretary or maybe they're just doing data entry just to help out so even if they get uh, demoted or even promoted you can always go up here and you can select their user and you can select exactly what a uh, role you want them to have. So if they're just go down from administrator to just the assistant admin that we had edited previously, then we can just remove the admin role and just add in the assistant one. Another thing that you'll notice is that you also have the option to resend an invitation. So if you do add in a user and they're like, you know, I didn't get the email, could you resend it? You can always go up here to users and just select their uh, particular email address, and then you can resend that information if you need to. We'll go ahead and save those changes, and it'll be marked as such. And then we have our new assistant. So now we have our actual book that we need to start setting up. So we can go back up here to the settings icon. We've already went through all of the general settings for your site itself. Now that we have our book, now we can actually start setting up that book. And uh, just to reiterate, you know, we, we recommend having just 
one book for your entire entity for your uh, your accounting uh, books or your accounting assets, liabilities, etc., all wrapped up into one. Most most of our churches wouldn't have more than maybe one or two. So uh, you know, if you don't have four like I have, then no worries. It's just uh, just more of an example for you. Uh, if you needed to ever edit that book, then we could go back down here and we can select our books. And just like roles and users, you can go over here and you can edit the name and you can definitely see what the starting date is for as well. Whenever you update it, just click submit and everything will be good. One final aspect of this is your payees. And this is kind of uh, unique in that your payees are attached to your site and not just your books. So, you know, even if you have uh, uh, different books, different accounts, different payments, um, et cetera, then you can still pay the vendor because, you know, you're probably going to pay the same power company or the same water bill or, uh, whatever if it's in the same vicinity then you're going to still use the same vendor information so if you ever needed to add in a new payee you could go to the gear icon click payees and then you'll notice all of your payees here if you scroll down here you can add a new one at any time and just enter in the name company address whatever it is that you have I believe the first and last, or the first name is the only one that's required. You do not need to have a last name, uh, but just so that you have the most, uh, as much information as possible, you can always just put in as much uh, information that you have. And in addition to that, you can also add in notes just for uh, certain references. So if maybe I'm adding in, in Williams as maybe a new employee, then I can add him and then submit it. And you can see that he is created right here. And if you ever needed to uh, just edit his information, you can just click his row and add in that information. And I also, when you hover over a over it, you can notice that there's this history icon. And if you click on the history, then you can see all of the uh, payment history as well. And we can always just use the breadcrumbs just to go back should we ever need it. It's a little faint, but in the event you ever need to delete a pay, it's not recommended naturally if you have transactions for them, but you can. Uh, click this minus button and you can either delete it or deactivate it. So uh, if it does have any sort of transactions, then it does want to retain that information. So you'll be able to just deactivate it if you are no longer using that vendor. Uh, but if you use, say, Ken Williams, I have no transactions for him then I can go ahead and delete it. So this is also a quick way to see if there's any transactions, but just to be on the safe side, wouldn't recommend just deactivating it willy-nilly. <laughs> now, what most of you have been waiting for, now we can actually get into the actual chart of accounts. And so before we do that, because I love making you guys wait, let me just go through those different account types real quick. So in Church 360, we start with the assets and just basically what your congregation owns. So whatever it is you guys own, whether it is say your current or your monetary 
That includes things like your money in your checking or savings account, any sort of CDs, any stocks, anything that you just actually um, that you know you could sell uh, whenever for or use immediately for your uh, monetary needs. And you also have your fixed or non-monetary assets as well. So you want to make sure that you uh, keep in mind things like your buildings, your land, uh, any sort of equipment, and then those would be your fixed assets as well. So I have made mention of restricted funds and they are, they do deviate from the Shepherd Staff dedicated funds. Uh, so in and of itself, the restricted funds are kind of, are still money reserved for a specific purpose, uh, but they can't really be budgeted because uh, they are kind of, just kind of part of the asset pie. So it, it's not really uh, an IOU, it's not really an income and or expense, it is just, it's actually physically set aside in your book to be uh, for this specific purpose. And since it has kind of that asset behavior, those balances do carry over to the next year. And if you need to see those restricted fund balances, they're going to be held in that, that same asset account. So all of your asset accounts are going to be uh, compiled of, or comprised of both restricted and unrestricted funds. So anytime a restricted fund is part of that asset, you're also going to have that, those general funds that don't have a specific purpose as well. Then we have liabilities, and these are the amounts that we owe. So this could include things like short-term debt, whether it's payroll taxes, your HCS accounts, uh, offerings for other congregations, or even like long-term debt, such as mortgages, loans, or even if you have like a church car or a van, then, you know, loans on that would be uh, included as well. So with this introduction between restricted accounts and liabilities, uh, we just thought that it would be helpful to just kind of highlight uh, using dedicated slash restricted uh, money uh, and how to group that in your chart of accounts. And you could uh, theoretically use either the restricted accounts that are built in, or you can use liabilities. But just for the sake of argument, we do want you to know the pros and cons for that. And those for the cons would include things like you can't make a deposit to a liability account. So any deposit that you want to make towards a restricted purpose, it would need to be uh, done as a journal entry from your asset account. And you can also not really use pending transactions uh, due to not being able to make deposits directly to those liability accounts. So anything from Church 360 members, you would definitely kind of have to tweak those. If you did use liabilities instead of the restricted funds, then you can see them as liabilities naturally on the balance sheet. So if that's very important to you, then that would be a reason to use those liabilities. And as a result, you can forego using a corresponding income and expense account to show uh, exactly where that money is going in and out instead of uh, having to show the different offsets for those restricted funds, because if they, if they act like asset accounts, which they're meant to be, uh, then they would need their own offset accounts for income and expense, just to show what that flow of money is. Next, we have income accounts. And just like the name, it is anything that is received. 
So any sort of revenue that you receive during your fiscal year, that's going to be recorded as income. And since this is an offset account showing exactly where the money is going within the year, it can be budgeted. Different examples for uh, budgeting for income could be like things like offerings, any sort of interest that you might uh, earn on bank accounts or savings accounts. Uh, if you have rental property, then you could definitely add that in as an income as well. And since this is uh, particular to your specific fiscal year, at the end of that fiscal year, it does jump back down to zero and starts over uh, when that new fiscal year begins. Similar to income, we have expense on the other side. And that's how the money is spent. It can also be budgeted and with examples such as salaries, any sort of materials that you use for your church, office supplies, any sort of postage, anything you want to keep track of, the in and out of money, like even at the very end, just utilities, uh, then expense would definitely be helpful to uh, to show that audit trail. And with it being budgeted every year and it being showing the flow during the year, it is going to zero out just like an income account as well. So with those account types in mind, now we can actually start uh, building up our chart of accounts. So in order to actually make changes to your chart of accounts, you're going to want to go up to the setting icon and go to chart of accounts. If you go over here to the reports to chart of accounts, you won't be able to make any changes. So to actually make those changes, we'll go here and your chart of accounts will eventually look something like this. So when you're just starting out, naturally these are going to be pretty blank. And over here, you're going to be able to add in a new category or a new account. So Ledger does have these categories to make things just a little easier to read. Uh, basically anything inside of the category, any accounts or subcategories, they're going to be totaled. So, since we're on assets, we can just go ahead and add in maybe say um, miscellaneous. And here you can see that we have a miscellaneous for this book. And in the same aspect, you can create different categories. So maybe if this is more, or maybe a youth group, just miscellaneous expenses, you have just a separate account for that, then you can certainly uh, create a miscellaneous category. And if you needed to make something strictly for maybe petty cash for your youth group. Then you can create that and set that up. And here you can see kind of like this. I always think of eggs, like a carton of eggs right here. If you click on here and drag it, then you can set it inside of a different category. So if it's all the way to the left, it's a category. If you want it to be part of another category, then you can just kind of set that in here and it nests like that. And similar to uh, what you see here, you can add another account. And since this is an asset account, you can choose whether or not you can write checks from this account. And if that is the case, you can create your initial balance. Uh, it is important to make sure that you put your initial balance as of uh, when this account was created. Otherwise, uh, you know, if you have different uh, transactions and you've reconciled, then changing the initial balance is definitely not recommended if you ever need to kind of uh, 
change the different beginning balances, it's definitely recommended to use transfer accounts. And you can add in a, an account number if you want to, but say maybe it's just a, a brand new account and it just has $100 for your youth group. And then they can just have that uh, particular asset account for them. And then you can uh, click the egg carton here and you can either put it in just for the miscellaneous youth group. And you can see here that it does total within the category or you can have it within the petty cash group. And you can see that it's totaled there. Uh, so anything that's in the subcategory is totaled. Anything that's just uh, under this entire umbrella is going to be totaled as well. So say if maybe, maybe your, uh, your church hosts the Girl Scouts and maybe they have $50 in their uh, particular account, then you don't want them to be part of the youth group, but it is a youth group. So you can always go back and maybe change it to uh, the Boy Scouts or whatever. Uh, but for the most part, you do want to see that uh, the youth group being in petty cash, it totals it here. And then with the Girl Scouts and the youth group accounts, the uh, miscellaneous youth group, it is completely totaled here. So it includes both of those accounts. So kind of seeing the 50 and then 100 and 100, uh, it might uh, kind of make you do a double take, but since this is a, a category, it's just totaling it. So you won't, you won't be able to make any budgets or anything uh, or add anything to categories it will just total up whatever accounts are within it. And then once you create any sort of asset account, you can see here, you can add a restricted fund. So here you can see that the USS, USAA checking, it has both a building fund and a restricted fund. So in creating the building fund, this unrestricted account uh, was created and it's essentially just, oh, this uh, or whatever your uh, overall checking account is uh, minus uh, whatever is in the restricted fund. So here you have uh, 18,000 uh, minus this five, uh, 5,350 and you get this. So uh, it's just uh, just basically a calculation. And if you needed to add a new restricted fund for this particular asset account, you certainly can. So in addition to the building fund, maybe this checking account is going to have a mission fund for its particular um, asset as well. You're more than welcome to have an account number, but overall, you just create another uh, restricted account. Initially, you won't be able to determine an initial balance for this because, you know, it's just a piece of the pie of this USA, USAA checking. So you're going to have to move uh, any sort of transaction from your restricted over to your mission fund. And we'll be going over that for transfers during our transaction webinar sometime tomorrow. All right, we are we are finishing up. We just have a, two more things to go over for today. And that one, the last or one of the last ones is going to be budgets. And as you can see, I did make uh, changes to this chart of accounts. And in the event I don't save those changes, it's always going to make sure that I remember. And if I wanted to discard those changes, I can. Otherwise, I can just go ahead and confirm those. So once we navigate away from that chart of accounts, we have our budget area.
And here you can uh, see that some of them are kind of grayed out. Those are the categories. And the ones that are kind of in the white lines, those are the actual accounts. So these are what you're actually going to edit. And here you can see that you can choose just the overall total, or you can choose a monthly total as well. So here you can see for this youth fund, it is at 1200 for $100 each of the 12 months. Or you could click inside of this fund and just choose uh, which monthly uh, allowance you want them to have. And then it's just added up, not only here, but also whatever category you have um, uh, these particular accounts in. And you can always just click inside and uh, you could just type in that budget for the yearly or the monthly budget. Or right down here, you can see what the previous year budget was and what was actually spent for that year. So just kind of uh, just as a heads up, if you ever wanted to uh, choose that number, then you can click on it here and it will save it for you. So uh, not only can you apply the previous year budget or the actual to a particular account, but if you go up here to this change all to drop down menu, you can choose to change all of the accounts to last year's budget or last year's actual. Really, whatever it is that's uh, best for you, you can certainly do that. And once everything looks good, you will just uh, scroll down and uh, click the Save button at the bottom. Of course, if you ever forget and not save it, then you can always navigate away and it'll just save it for you. Then finally, we have fiscal years. And right here underneath the gear icon, we have our fiscal years. And you can see the entire history of your book. You can see here that it is uh, about 10 years old and you still have all of your uh, transactions, all of your history here as well. And if you ever needed to create a new fiscal year, you could always make sure that you're on the most recent one and you could choose your starting month and click save whenever you're ready for that 2023 fiscal year. In the event that you ever needed to go back to a fiscal year to either uh, apply a different transaction or to maybe reconcile if you need to, then you can use these lock buttons here. It's a little confusing. If you see here where it says unlock, it means that the fiscal year actually is locked. So whichever button that you, uh, that you see, if you click on it, that is the action it's going to do. So here you can see that 2018 is locked. And if you click here, it'll unlock. But if you wanted to go ahead and re-lock it, then you would click the red button. And if you ever needed to uh, unlock a fiscal year, you would have to go down here and unlock all of the uh, subsequent years just to go back to it and then once you're finished you would go ahead and lock the rest of them to get back to your current year and that would be just about sum that up so real quick i'm just going to go over just a quick little quiz just to reiterate exactly what we reviewed today. And that first question is going to be, 
what type of account is used to create a bank account? Is that the asset account? Is it a restricted fund, which acts like an asset account? Or is it an income account? Mm -hmm. Okay, wrap that up. That answer is an asset account. So an asset account is just anything that you, your congregation actually owns. And that includes the uh, money that are, that is in your bank. So that includes your bank balances. Next, if, you if your church decides to take out a loan, what type of account would it actually be? Would it be an expense, because we're paying it back? Is it an income, because we initially came, brought it in? Or is it a liability? All right. And that is a liability. So anything that you owe that you need to pay back, it is considered a liability. So if you take out any loan, then uh, it will be a liability. The only time it would not be would be if it was just a gift and not a loan. Now, this is a multiple choice one, which type of accounts have budgets assigned to them? Mm -hmm. Is what you own gonna change during the year? Is what you owe going to change? Your income or your expense? That answer is C and D, the income and expense. <laughs> and then finally we have, is a restricted fund, will it carry over its balance? Okay, that one was a quick one. And that is true. So it is attached to your uh, asset, and so it actually has that money in it. So it's going to actually carry over as part of that asset account. So does anybody have any questions? No, nope, doesn't look like it. All right, then. Then I hope you guys enjoyed today's webinar. And if you guys have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. We are always happy to help you. And uh, we'll just talk to you soon. Thank you so much, guys. Have a good one.